Good afternoon. Yeah. All right. First of all, I'd like to say thank you for joining us for the 2016 in John lecture series. This series is sponsored by the family of Emmy John. Would you please stand? And the Department of Agricultural Economics, Sociology, and Education. This series began in 1981 to honor the late Dr. Macklin E. John, Jr. <clears throat> Dr. John was born in Paul, Illinois on January 23, 1906. He received his BS degree in 1929 and his MS degree in 1932 from Iowa State College and his PhD degree in 1937 from Cornell University. He arrived at Penn State University as professor of rural sociology in 1936. Wow, 1936, and I complained about how long I've been here. <laughs> and later took on the assignment of extension specialist in rural sociology. He assumed the position of head of the department in 1947. At this time, the department was renamed the Department of Agricultural Economics and Rural Sociology. Dr. John stepped down as head in 1969 and retired from the university in June 1970. Dr. John was instrumental in pushing forward the values and mission of the land-grant university during his tenure at Penn State and well into his retirement. In keeping with his dedicated work towards the role of the land-grant university and the development of communities across the state and beyond, we have the pleasure of hearing this message from Dr. Kenneth Jones today. I had the opportunity to meet Kenneth, I'm going to give a little story, um, when we were both graduate students uh, at a Manners conference in 2001. Yes, and I remember having a conversation saying, wow, you know, it's nice to see someone else who's taking this journey, and now here we are, 16 years, 15 years later, um, both of us in careers that I can say we truly do love and admire. I remember <clears throat> talking with him about his passion and his work in this field, and Kenneth truly does represent a steward of the Land Grant University. He is an alum of Penn State University's Agricultural and Extension Education Department and now is the director of the Program and Staff Deve Development Unit for the University of Kentucky Cooperative Extension Service. He provides statewide direction for program development and evaluation and training of county-based and state-level extension, cooperative extension staff and faculty. Dr. Jones is also an associate professor in the Department of Community and Leadership Development, where his research interests include assessing youth adult, youth adult relationships within community context, understanding the role of youth adult partnerships in nurturing youth leadership, positive youth development, and theoretical approaches to community development initiatives. Please help me to welcome our 2006 Emmy John Lecture Series speaker, Dr. Kenneth Jones. Well, good afternoon. It is definitely a pleasure to be here uh, in Happy Valley once again. And I never knew when I would make it back to this area, but I appreciate Dr. Webster extending the opportunity to me and being able to connect with so many of my friends as I've been here for, seems like a week already, but because I've been doing so much, she's keeping me very busy, but I've definitely enjoyed uh, my time here. Uh, Dr. Bowen, was the first to give me my, Dr. Blaneyborn was the first to give me my first taste of Penn State as a, as a master's student uh, back in 2000, uh, 2000 1995. And um, uh, you know, it's uh, quite interesting, even though we don't get a chance to talk that often, 
Uh, I still model myself after him. Sometimes I'm talking to some of my graduate students and I look around to see if he's standing in the room because I'm saying some of the things that he has instilled upon me from years past. So, uh, Dr. Bourne, I really appreciate that. And even going to Kentucky the first time, uh, as, a, as a county agent, as you can see there, I've sort of laid out my background. Uh, Dr. Bowen had me to return to Penn State to address the Food and Ag Science Institute, which was a summer project or summer program that he had uh, created for uh, minority students to expose them to the field of agriculture. And I didn't know what I was in for. He just asked me to come and, and serve as the keynote speaker for the final banquet. But that weekend, he spent quite a bit of time trying to convince me why I should come back to Penn State. Uh, for my doctoral work and I told him at that time that I was interested in pursuing my doctorate after about three or four years of working with Extension. Um, so in um, 2000, uh, 2001 is when I made that journey back but he was really talking to me about how the department was doing some innovative things and he said oh yeah I've got, we've got this new faculty member that's here and he's uh, really hit the ground running with some new development approaches and I informed Dr. Bowen that uh, even though my graduate, my master's work was within the lines of uh, youth development, but I've sort of gotten away from that because in, as an agent, I started out as a 4-H agent, then switched over to Ag and Natural Resources, and I was doing a lot of community development work because I was in an urban area, Louisville, at the time. So I wasn't quite sure if I would plan on going back into youth development, but he said, oh yeah, but this guy's really good. And I said, okay, well, who are you talking about? He said, Danny, his name's Danny, Danny Perkins. And I said, okay, so we'll, we'll give him a call and, and, and see what he's about. And I talk to Danny about my interest and of course Danny in classic Danny fashion told me exactly what his area was and that it was not ag and natural resources and community development. Um, but we came to a compromise and, and uh, I think that uh, relationship worked out well. I, I learned a lot from Danny. I'd have a lot of respect for him and um, he's definitely um, allowed me to develop specific, more specifically in the area of uh, youth development and some of the things that I've been able to do and uh, he has also helped me with some various connections uh, in working with a number of colleagues that I have always admired in, in my graduate program as a student here. So uh, there are several people uh, that I enjoyed having dinner with last night, Dr. Rama Radhakrishna, Dr. Kathy Bowen, um, so many, Joan Thompson, so good to see you, um, so many, uh, Dr. Kaplan, uh, was in, I think it was uh, Dr. Ingram, the two of you started as faculty members when I was returning as a doctoral student. So uh, we've got that connection there. Uh, so it's just so good to be able to come back see a, a few graduate students that were here when I was here. So it's just, just a nice time to, to, to connect with folks. So um, as you can see there, that's sort of my timeline. I'm currently in the Department of Community and Leadership Development and it's very similar to your academic unit. We've got rural sociologists, we've got ag ed faculty, we've got ag communication folks, so it's a hodgepodge of things, if you will, um, but uh, very similar to uh, some of the experiences that you have here. Um, when I went to Kentucky, I had a joint appointment with the academic department and with 4-H youth development, um, and I served in that capacity until 2010, and that's when I took on the role as an administrator, as they say, the dark, going to the dark side. Um, working with program and staff development. And with that, um, that includes working with our county extension agents and our extension faculty to uh, assist with their professional development experiences. So uh, the in, what we call our in-service trainings that agents have to acquire to get promoted. Um, I also deal with reporting. Um, so this time of year is not a very, I'm a very popular person in Kentucky, that, let's just say that, because I'm constantly asking folks to make sure they get their documentation in, for the federal reports that we have to submit on behalf of the college and so on and so forth. So, and also going into a new fiscal year, that's a busy time as well to make sure we're wrapping up things there for the system. So I was given the title and um, I've taken a, a somewhat unique spin on it, but I think we'll, we'll definitely uh, get to some of the areas that I want to, to cover. Um, we'll take a look at a, the um, well, I also I forgot this slide here. I, as you can see, I do have fond memories of the winners here in, in Pennsylvania as well. So just as an overview, I, we'll take a look at the background of the land grant mission, as many of you are very familiar with, uh, I'm sh quite sure. And um, from there, taking the concept of leadership development in the 
frame of developing leaders and the expectations of land grant administrators, and then tying the leadership on how it can help institutions be more competitive in a global society. We'll talk a little bit about the products of the land grant system, being our students' research opportunities as well as outreach, and then also taking a look and just sharing you some examples of what Kentucky, what we've done in Kentucky to sort of capture the importance of globalization and learning and making sure that we are equipping our future leaders with what they need to be successful in the land grant system, whether that be at the university or within ex the extension system. So when we think of the land grant college and university and, and the missions thereof, the original mission of these institutions as set forth in the first moral act was to teach agriculture, military tactics, and the mechanic arts as well as classical studies so members of the work cla working class could obtain a liberal practical education. And many of you are familiar with the Kellogg Commission that came out in 2000 and I really think they captured it with, when it comes to the missions that the uh, commission captured a lion's share of what we must do to be fruitful vessels in this area. And here we are 20 years later and a lot of these concepts are still very relevant, uh, noting the fact that we have to make sure that it's uh, more or less a double-edged sword that we're uh, tackling the challenges on both ends, maintaining our legacy of world-class education and research and public service, while at the same time making sure that we're remaining relevant and responsive to the needs of those that we serve. So who are we and what are our missions? If you look at the missions of the land grants across the country, many of them are very similar. I pulled this one off of the uh, Penn State homepage. We strive to celebrate diversity in all aspects of our educational and operational activities designed to result in ongoing improvements that help prepare future generations. Very similar to the mission of Kentucky where it, we're focusing on improving the lives of individuals, uh, excelling in education, creative work and service, promoting diversity again, and also making sure that we're inclusive and focusing on human well-being. And even if we look at those across the country, as I mentioned, very much similar, but most of our strides are pertain to what our, department, our, our part, departments are focusing on to improve quality of life. And we have to make sure we understand what we mean by that. And it's certainly not an easy task, but I think it may start with the leadership at the helm, the leaders that are in place who, who are prepared to tackle many of the obstacles that we face in making sure that the land grant institutions and public institutions in general remain relevant. Some of you may remember uh, a discussion that was led, I believe, by Graham Spanier at the time, where there were several uh, land grant leaders that came actually to Penn State to talk about uh, some of these initiatives. It has been an ongoing discussion, as you can see, and uh, there were several things that were uh, expressed as far as what was most important just a few years ago. Privatita privatization of public higher education. Many schools feel as if they're no longer state supported, but more so state assisted, given the climate that we're in right now. Um, this, this is definitely much deeper than autonomy and financial models. The mission of the public institution is what matters most. It is almost like a continuum for most schools where we're wanting to hold true to the land grant mission, but we also have that pressure of being the next great institution. And with that comes a cost, uh, money for needed research, top faculty, recruiting students. And if states can't get the money, they're pressed to look in other areas. Globalization of public and private higher education where we continue to grapple with worldwide conversations about the dissemination of uh, our educational means and using technology to promote that and also making sure that we are equipping our students with the skills that they need to be globally competitive. Complex needs for our students and many people tend to uh, believe that the undergrad experience has become very similar to the high school experience. Um, that being said, I'm, we're, I'm thinking about the fact that many of our students, and you know, I, I can say for, for Kentucky, maybe not here at Penn State, but some of those students that are coming in, uh, they're so used to memor memorizing what they need to pass the test, get the A, and then they move on. But a lot of times we're missing many of the pieces to make sure that they are fully prepared to tackle the world. 
and a student with a degree from a university does not necessarily make them the best representation of that institution or the department for that matter. A quality of student learning ties into that and the erosion of public commitment to the land grant mission which can really play a major part which ties to how the public will see that institution of higher learning. And when we think about the public's view, uh, there have been uh, many discussions around that, uh, but the public's view can give us a good indication of how we are really doing. Years ago, the American Council on Education reported that 74% of the public rated the quality of four-year colleges as very high, good or excellent. While there was a high level of distrust in corporations, Congress, and public schools, now imagine that, there was a high level of faith remaining in higher education. And there was a similar study, uh, the um, American, the, the organization that conducted this study also conducted state level uh, assessments as well. And they found something similar with Kentucky, 50, uh, with Pennsylvania, 56% were pleased with the Pennsylvania colleges giving a high rating compared to only 39% rating public schools favorably here in Pennsylvania. And so if we look more currently at the view of the public universities, that shift is occurring quite drastically. Uh, although Americans still generally agree that a degree is worth attaining, there's a desire for college to, colleges to be more flexible and affordable. And I don't think many of us, whether you're a student or faculty or staff, would disagree with that. But if we also think about the funding that's going towards states, nearly all states have cut expenses when it comes to uh, supporting universities on a per student basis. Um, many of those have experienced cuts based on state appropriations, aid to students, et cetera. And I don't know if many of you are familiar with the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, but they conducted the study and revealed, and some of you may be familiar with these numbers here, revealed the, the significant cuts that have occurred since the Great Recession 2007-2008, um, up to 36% in Pennsylvania alone, which puts Pennsylvania only fourth behind four other states that had more drastic cuts. So we're definitely looking at some, some changes towards higher education, and it should definitely uh, bring to our attention that we have to make sure that we're proactive in uh, demonstrating that we are indeed serving our purposes. So is there a correlation with that? I'm not necessarily sure, but I do know that our governor in Kentucky um, really changed my mentality and, and a lot of folks because you know, there's the saying about politicians that they say one thing and they do another. Well, I will tell you that our current governor who took office just a few months ago campaigned on the notion that he would cut funding from the high chair to higher education. And to our chagrin, he has done exactly what he said he was going to do. So it, as I say jokingly about politicians, you know, it's, it has been to our, to our detriment. But um, I think it's important to, to look at those situations that are occurring across the country. And if it continues, as it m may very well do that, I do know that if current budget trends continue to be in the situation where it's a no, no budget or uncertain budgets, this will transfer into enrollment decreases. We'll face high levels of college graduates at a time when states need to be developing talent and a more highly skilled workforce to ensure future growth and prosperity. Is it all about the leadership? Is it the leadership's responsibility? So whose role is it? Most would say it falls on anyone in a leadership role and I will use the term leader in a general term, one who has the ability to exert power and influence. Um, there are many theoretical approaches around leadership and given the time allotted, I don't have enough time to expound on all the leadership theories that exist. But if you look at uh, many of the, the notions around leadership, it, it, it really ties back to the evolution of thought on the subject itself. And it's very vast and increasingly complex. Over time, leadership theorists have built upon each other's ideas and discoveries, creating an interdisciplinary study that draws on many academic disciplines, including psychology, community psychology, systems theory, anthropology, you name it. But I think our colleagues captured a lot of that when they noted here, and I'll 
an article a couple of years ago that how colleges of agriculture and life sciences academic program leaders lead their colleges and faculty through the changes and their style of leadership could ensure the success of their higher education institutions. The leadership of colleges will be a determining factor of whether the college will be able to successfully and effectively manage this change. And many of us are looking for those natural born leaders to take, take the helm. Uh, they do exist, but in extremely rare forms, despite how we may feel about those leaders and how we may feel about our own leadership. Uh, but the born leader is definitely extremely rare. With this, we are expecting someone to possess charisma, passion, energy, technical knowledge, and organizational wisdom, and then at the same time, be able to impart that upon those that work under them as subordinates. And that probably makes many of you tired just thinking about that. But even when, if, we, if they do exist, the rarity ensues. And we expect for those leaders to come riding in on a white horse to save us. And most of our universities and departments don't have time to wait for that natural born leader to ride in and save us. And we may come up with tons of ways to define what we look for in a leader and what we want in a leadership style, what leadership traits are important. But that list tends to look like this a lot of explanations, but may not necessarily tie us into exactly where we're wanting to go, looking at all the, the theorists that are out there. And it's my understanding that uh, your department is in a situation that's very similar to my department. We're in the process of looking for a department chair. And you know, really the gist of it is to find someone that is a good fit, right? Whatever that means. And for some people, that may mean that you just want to have someone that you feel comfortable sharing a beer with on Fridays. Or it could be that it's someone that respects your work or someone that you can get along with um, relatively easy. And you don't necessarily care a lot about their academic record or uh, many of those scholarly endeavors that they've encountered or they've developed. You just want to know can they lead? And that's the, the bottom line. And it may not exactly come out within the discussions that you partake in, and it may not come to fruition based on the background you have in leadership. But I think one thing that we can agree on is this, that you may not know what a good leader, how it's defined, but you know good leadership when you see it. And I think with leadership, that's that's the, the, the realness of it all. That's the most important piece that we make sure that we're wanting uh, to capture. So we have few options when it comes to finding those leaders that can lead us. And one is to wait on one or create some. And to me, I think creating some can definitely be more intuitive. So some include the students that we nurture, the teams we lead, and the colleagues that we see the leadership within and sometimes the leadership that we may see in ourselves or, or in others. We have to take ownership of that and move forward to advance where we are. So if we happen to be the chosen leaders or if you have a good fortune of being someone who is respected by a leader that makes decisions, we have to take upon the honest to rally behind the charge that we've been given. And needless to say, when we look at the next group of leaders, in a majority of cases, it's going to be that younger generation the Gen X and the Gen Y. Now, I know some of you are probably cringing when you think about that, but it is definitely true that they are uh, the pool from which we may necessarily be choosing. And so I, I'm not going to insult your intelligence and, and give you all the characteristics of the different generations. If you're like me, you've seen that presentation about a thousand times or more. And even now, they're beginning to utilize that to uh, do tests when it comes to personality traits, like your Myers-Briggs and your true colors. They're beginning to use generations to sort of categorize you. And for me, it's always pretty much the same. You can categorize me based on age, and I know exactly where I am, but when I look at all the different characteristics across the board, I sort of fit, match several of those uh, different traits that, that, that fit, fit me. Um, but again, I think it's uh, something that we definitely need to, to grapple with. Um, so I didn't understand Generation Y until I saw this clip here. <laughs> Go figure. Generation X, of course, you know, it's the, 
the X factor generation, you know, they, they, they've written books about it, but Generation Y, I couldn't quite come up with that, that title on how they came about until I saw this. And so again, this probably makes you cringe even more when you see this, when we're thinking about these are going to be our next leaders. Um, but it's important to make sure that we know uh, what we're working with and, and the work that has to be done. So a few things about Generation X and Generation Y that I think they have in common is that uh, one is that they came up in an era when everyone got a trophy and everyone was rewarded. But they don't necessarily want all the c that comes with earning that trophy. This leads to a misunderstanding by older supervisors, for example, who don't get this. It's not appropriate to write off all millennials as lazy and not dedicated. They're very observant and can see the experiences of their bosses, their managers who are rewarded for doing a good job by getting an, an even more intense workload, but getting very little support with that. And they're, all, they're also fearful of what is going to happen within the economy, given the fact that they were old enough to witness what was going on just a few year, years ago with the Great Recession with, uh, within little less than a decade and experiencing the impact on their, their family members and maybe some friends. But nonetheless, they are our future and we have to consider this pool as we look forward. When it comes to students, I think we can make sure that uh, preparing our students for opportunities is key beyond their limited scope. Although many of them are more tech savvy, we can't rule them all as such. I was in the airport as I was coming here uh, the other day and I was sitting next to a, a mother and her teenage son and she asked him, can you tell me how to uh, correct the settings on this Facebook page? And he didn't know how to do it and she was floored. And so he said he didn't know how to do it, but I wanted to lean over and say, ma'am, they're so far beyond Facebook that they don't even fool with those settings in Facebook anymore. That's for us older folks that are just grabbing on to that. And I, I think about our babysitter. She struggles to set the DVR to record my son's shows on Sprout that he likes. So, you know, there's, there, there is some, some work to be done there, but I think more importantly, even though they may be tech savvy, they still lack a lot of those skills that we know are, are very important to uh, function in a competitive global job market and those skills could include those that are very, very difficult to teach, like uh, punctuality, um, integrity, dependability, passion, problem solving, divergent thinking. Those are the types of things that the next generation of leaders will definitely uh, need to embrace. And not to say that many of our younger generation don't have those skills, but uh, I think because of the changing dynamics of today's society and, and such a fast pace uh, that we're in, these things are still critical for us to impart upon them. And I also re I remember uh, an Asian uh, student talking about his experience with his professor. And uh, when he was in, uh, he was back home as an undergraduate and he talked about how the professor at the beginning of every day he wanted his students to engage him in a conversation about what was going on in the United States. And it didn't matter if they talked about American politics, which I could see that being a very interesting conversation covering most of the time in class, but they could talk about that or they could talk about reality TV. And so that sort of stumped me and I said, really? But the gist of it is that it's not enough to understand the politics within our country to be competitive in a global side, to society. And it's not enough to speak the language, but you also need to understand the culture. And that professor understood that and imparted that upon his students. So you know, when we think about the things we've been discussing when it comes to globalization and that it's coming, it's coming. It's already here. The Kellogg Commission, going back to, to, to that work, discussed the importance of strengthening the link between discovery and learning by providing more opportunities for hands-on learning, including undergraduate education, but also raised the critical urgency to enhance graduate education, which in my mind yields to the importance of developing future scholars who will continue the work of research and development. The land-grant institution has an essential role to play here. Many of our universities are research intensive and we have to continue generating knowledge to address the needs of the people in our states. 
the American Association of Universities, which I believe Penn State's still a member, uh, noted that academic gen academia generates over half the country's basic research, and that's great. But we also need to make sure we are taking the lead on conducting research that is applicable to practitioners as well as those in need of solutions. Universities perform 56% of the nation's basic research. And although that basic research continues to define academic work at most research universities, nearly 70% of participants in an international study characterize their research as applied or a combination of both, 25% indicated uh, basic and applied research was a part of their work. So the emphasis on applied research is not only related to funding and university strategies, one could argue that this is in relation to the simple law of supply and demand. Many people are wanting research that applies to their situation and can improve their lives. So university researchers are adhering to this, in part because funders are demanding it. So yes, more universities are playing a role in the country's ability to drive innovation in the global economy. This is nothing new to land grants. Other schools have picked up on this and the pool of money to conduct such research has gotten much more competitive to access. Some of you may recall the conference that I mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago here about the, uh, the emphasis on the land grants in 2011. And there was a, a, a quote out of that a report uh, that I thought was very fitting that acknowledged extension for its uniqueness uh, and its extension, getting that information out to the people that need it. Uh, the key values of the institution, that it's the notion that ties public service and makes it available to those in the state, the region, and, and the nation. Extension's role offers public service beyond state and national borders to improve the human condition, but now must be balanced to pressing current issues on higher education. However, with the globalization of public higher education, with rising competitors, and I say competitors instead of collaborators at this point that I'll expound on later, and what appears to be an erosion of public support, Extension must up the ante on addressing complex needs of today's clientele. We're beyond the days when only building relationships were key, although that's very important. Uh, relying on the support of those who know us and liked us. And that's something that I often communicate to our new agents when they're coming in. Uh, they're establishing themselves on that history that uh, in some of our rural communities, everyone's very favorable of extension, they support us. And many people may want to sleep on their laurels and say, well, anyone's ready to go to bat for extension and say what we do. But that pool of people who know us very well and will advocate for us is much, much smaller than the people that don't know us at all or the people that may know us but don't really know what we're all about. And so we have to make sure that we are tapping that audience as well. And that sort of gets into the, the, the big discussion around public value and why that's so important. So moving beyond those days of just relationships but relying on um, those resources to help appeal to the vast majority. So it's key to brand extension as an element that gives rise to the organization, which in turn perpetuates the land-grant institution. Some of you may remember the article that was written back in 2004 in Journal of Extension about extension, is it still relevant? And that conversation continued with an, uh, a very provocative article in Progressive Pharma. Um, and that really got our attention in Kentucky and we got Quite a few calls about that. Our agents were alarmed because here's the information, but it's nothing new. Those questions are, have been asked before and they continue to be asked, but we are just being uh, challenged with it more now, but making sure that we're having to, the answers and the response is most important. And then there are also those uh, articles. This one was in the Pew Charitable Trust, an article there that talked about extension revamping itself. Uh, which I think did a very good job of, of highlighting the resources that the organization provides, as well as being able to show that we are beyond just the cows and cooking when it comes to 4-H, beyond just going out and visiting with the farmer uh, and having a couple conversations over, over coffee, but much more intensive in, and intentional of what we're doing. So leading in a global society is going to take some effort, nonetheless. But from the 50,000 foot perspective, we have to make sure that the pieces are in place to continue our legacy. 
we have the institutional knowledge among us to learn what it takes to meet the continued demands and by goods and services, by goods more specifically, I, I'm more so implying about the students who will be going out into the workforce uh, and the services that we provide through the land grant institution and through extension and even the research that's conducted. But we have to make sure that we are fully prepared in this endeavor. This leads to the creation of those leaders who can execute on demand and tackle the challenges that we have tomorrow. We have no choice but to leave the world behind as it is. What we need to do is make sure the next generation is capable of tackling the world as it is and addressing those issues. Uh, we must embrace that and execute. And we start by fo focusing on what we are known for and go from there, and from there we look at grooming and producing leaders for that global society. And I will share quotes from uh, two well-known leadership gurus, if you will, Kuzis and Posner, and I think uh, they really capture it here. The best way to lead people into the future is to connect with them deeply in the present. We have to have visionaries who can see the big picture but stay deeply rooted in the mission that keeps us firmly grounded and the people and communities we are established served. Abraham Lincoln said when referring to the Morrill the Act, the land-grant university system is being built on behalf of the people who have invested in these public in universities, their hopes, their support, and their confidence. That is the obligation and that, is, that remains the charge. The next one there is, there's nothing more demoralizing than a leader who can't clearly articulate why we're doing what we're doing. If that is not an ability, we're all in trouble. Because when our existence is not understood, that is an absolute reason for cuts to funding, eliminating programs, and downsizing jobs. So more specifically, my purview is that our institutional leaders have to focus on a few things and do them well. So for the good of the global society, we're looking at a few things that I think are critical. Attracting and retaining an innovative workforce. In order to get people, we have to show something that appeals to them if we're looking to recruit individuals, the right individuals. And this doesn't mean making promises that we can't keep, but being intentional about what we're looking for, then finding out what it takes to attain the best and the brightest. I think we owe it to ourselves to do the work to investigate and find out what it takes to get what we want and keep them. If we want the best, then we're pretty sure that there are others that are probably competing for those individuals. Coach, mentor, serve, and allies. I went to a conference recently and one of the presenters in a particular session talked about the importance of uh, coaching and mentoring and, and serving as an ally and, and he indicated that a coach is, is someone that connects up close and guides you on what you need to do. A mentor opens doors for you when you are ready and an ally is someone that's already in the room and can get you, can get you in that room and advocate for you in addition to uh, what those others can do. So I think it's very important that we make sure that we understand that we have a role to play with our current students as well as our colleagues that may be junior faculty and the like uh, that, that also need that nurturing support. Investing in a development program, now notice I did not say a leadership program. Uh, I don't think that's the best word because from my experience when you go through a leadership program, you have a lot of people that automatically believe that because I have this leadership certification, then I should be the next boss, the, 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 the next administrator, the next great administrator, give me my raise now. But I think we need to make sure that we're understanding a development, development program tends to send a different message, that uh, it's not just about the individual, but it's about the whole. And when you're going through this, you are uh, developing those skills that will not just serve you, but will also serve the organization. And I've always lived by the f philosophy, and I heard it years ago, that we should, if you, we have more people that are willing to bloom where they're planted, and you have other people that can recognize those skills and talents of the individual, and then opportunities will come. But I think sometimes when we get caught up in that term leadership and, and putting people in leadership programs, um, that can send a, a negative message. And in Kentucky, we've sort of, uh, minimize the number of leadership programs that we have for that reason because uh, it did send uh, a different message. Diversity. Um, diversity is, is definitely much broader than, than uh, we may consider it to be. 
although it does mean race, ethnicity, gender, it's also encompassing of diversity of age and thought processes. It's not enough to use diversity and inclusion as a buzzword in the strategic plan, and I know we all have them in, in there, and, and, and they should be, but unless diversity is presented as an added value from the top administration, it's not going to thrive. We can hire the top VP of diversity, we can hire an assistant dean, we can hire an officer of diversity, but if that president or dean or department chair is hands off or refuses to engage when it comes to addressing an issue, it's null and void. Defining it is a great start, but we should make it a part of the university culture. Diversity can fuel the bottom line. For some, that may mean dollars. For some, it can mean enrollment numbers. Diversity is an asset-based approach, and not exploring the benefits of a diverse society is embracing a deficit model. Our students deserve the right to interact with cohorts that will reflect the world in which they will work and live. Faculty are better teachers, better scholars, when they have a better understanding of what's outside of their tiny box. And no matter how big you may think your box is, it's still smaller than the world beyond what we see. Scholars have clearly articulated the educational purposes and benefits of diversity. In fact, we can go back to Gordon Alport's contact hypothesis where in the 50s he talked about people coming together with different opinions and when they realized they had things in common, they worked for the common good. So this plays out in the workplace, uh, in the university settings. So it's very much in tune with uh, what we're needing to see as far as diversity and being incorporated from the top down. And that is the essence of what leaders will need to succeed in global societies, not only focusing on our superiority, but more or less capitalizing on the skills of others who can help us with our weaknesses, and that's how we build capacity. So, Thinking globally, act, acting locally, I think we need to foster a culture that does this. A broader experience can only help us grow. And leaders with broad experiences can help achieve or even broaden the reach of the land grant mission. We must continue strides from outreach to engagement. Against that backdrop, it's time to go beyond outreach and service to strengthen engagement. By this, we're looking at land grants to redesign their teaching, research, and extension efforts and function to become even more intentional and involved with their communities, whether that is defined as community of practice, community of place, community of interest. Engagement does, goes well beyond extension and conventional outreach and even most conceptions of public service. Again, the Kellogg Commission argued that the best ways to prepare students for the challenges life will place before them lies in integrating the community with their academic experiences. This makes them one of the principal engagement tools available to every university. And with that, I'm, as I close out, I'm going to just share a few things, as I mentioned, uh, with uh, the approaches that we've taken in Kentucky as to my lens of extension, which is, is my area more so, and how we've tried to be intentional about many of these things that I've shared with you today. And so the model that we try to focus on, as you can see here, recruit, develop, value, and reward. And this is for students, faculty, and staff. So with student development, we're talking about recruiting those students, the best and brightest. That's definitely what we want. And as you can see, and, you know, and when I shared our, our mission, it said that you know, we want to be the, the, the next great institution. Some, some people in Kentucky sort of have a problem with that. The next great institution. Should we be saying that we're already great? Um, but our, our students make uh, the, the, the most of that by uh, making sure that we're getting those students enrolled and involved on campus. Uh, we have a summer internship program with Extension and that's another way for us to recruit staff. So taking it from not just a student perspective but also looking at how we are grooming our Extension folks. It may be similar here in, in uh, Pennsylvania but in Kentucky within the next 10 years our system is going to look totally different. And we already are at the point where the majority of our agents, and we have over 400 extension agents in Kentucky, the majority are five years or less. Now, not all of them are fresh out of college because we've got some folks that are coming back in second careers. We've got a number that were uh, teachers and they retired and or worked with USDA, NRCS, some of those agencies, and now they're coming into extension. But a, a large number of those individuals are fairly young and um, we want to make sure that we give them experiences because we don't have the pool that we once had, where everyone knew about extension. And many of those extension agents, again, as I say in Kentucky, is my frame of reference, 
many of the ones that have been around 20 years grew up in 4-H. Well, we don't have that luxury anymore in many, many cases. A lot of the folks that stumble across an announcement related to extension are thinking, where in the world was this when I was a kid? Or, you know, how did I, how did I miss this? But they're passionate. They believe in the extension mich mission, and we want to hire them. But we've got to make sure that we're doing some things to make sure that they are aware of what the experiences are. And our internship program allows us to do that by giving them uh, previous exposure. And we learn about them, and they learn about us. And so I think that's, that's important. Our mentoring program, whether it's our, our faculty, our extension agents, uh, that's a way that we develop our, our agents. I can stand up in front of the new agents all day long, and they can listen to me. And I'm definitely much more engaging when I'm working with our extension audiences, I'll say that. Uh, so I'm kind of struggling behind this podium here and presenting this. But um, many of those agents, they get a lot more from their colleagues than they would ever get from me, even though I started out as a county agent. Um, to hear from those that are down in the trenches right now, that really makes a difference as far as uh, their development. So that mentoring piece is important. And then we also have what we call a career ladder. We don't have a tenure system in Kentucky. I know some states do, uh, but this career ladder is a, a promotion system where they come in at level one, and once they earn a certain number of training hours, once they engage in um, different types of programs, they're involved in committee work, and so on and so forth, they can be promoted to the next level. So that career ladder is something that we put in place um, probably about 10, 15 years ago because agents asked for it. And it had gotten to the point where many of them were doing great things, but again, going back to that recognition, um, we're trying to cater to that because we know that the majority of our population, they're looking for that trophy. And this is just a, a, a sample of that. So, Probably can't read this from, from the back there, but it just kind of lays out our onboarding process with our county extension agents, very similar to what you have here, I'm sure, in, in uh, Pennsylvania. We have a, uh, the internship, which we provide an orientation. Um, we have a roundup where the, the county ex interns also have to complete a uh, summer project, so at that roundup is when they present that. If they are hired, we have a new agent orientation that's about two and a half days where they come and get orientated to the campus, learn about benefits and those types of things. And then they go through a year of core training where we highlight those core topics that are, that are important for a county extension agent to be successful. Our county extension council, of course, that's the volunteer uh, system that we have that also we tie in to make sure that those folks are equipped with what they need to serve those counties because we don't want them to just come in and say, oh, agents, you're doing a good job, keep up the good work. And a lot of times they hear that, but we try to instill in them that they have a voice and that they can make a difference in that county as well based on their connection, especially if you have a new agent that's new. Uh, they're relying on those councils to sort of guide and direct them and help them to identify those individuals that can help them with their programming and their efforts in general. And then we have the, the cultural competence experiences. Uh, we've got uh, several agents that have been involved in some study abroad, short-term uh, initiatives. Our FCS unit, our, our director of family consumer sciences, takes a study abroad trip every summer and we have had agents to partake of that. We've got uh, quite a few things that come out of our Office of Diversity uh, where the assistant dean takes students. And we, we haven't had any agents yet to go, but students go to um, the Dominican Republic for uh, several weeks in the summer to get some experience there. But what we try to emphasize here is that is, this is not about, particularly with our agents, this is not about just going to uh, a cool place in the summer, but uh, it is communicating. Sometimes there, there is some misunderstanding about this. Uh, if you can communicate how this is going to improve your uh, county, then there is much more leeway and much less red tape in trying to maneuver that versus not being able to clearly uh, explain what the purpose of going to uh, or engaging in this international experience is going to provide to your counties. And we've got uh, uh, some very vocal counties that want to know where their agents are at all times. And so that, that's why it's very important for us to make sure that that connection is clear. So here's just a picture of our summer interns from last summer, and we have a very large internship program. And last year we had about 35 uh, summer interns. This year we're going to have about 42, 43. And it's a very diverse group, and we don't, we don't just 
um, target uh, minority um, interns, as you can see, we've got several females. If anything, when it comes to diversity, we need more males involved and uh, getting them involved and exposing them to uh, the, the work of extension. But this has become a major, major recruitment tool for us. We've got, right now we've got about 32% of our agents that were summer interns. But if you look at the, the ones that have started within the, the last five years, as I mentioned to you, the majority of those are probably interns or have been interns. So they're getting some exposure early on and then knowing what they're getting into, which is important because we want to be able to retain them. We also try to make sure that we are, are growing our own. Uh, Cecil probably recognizes this guy here. Uh, Ryan Quarles is our current Commissioner of Agriculture and he is definitely a poster child for our department. Um, uh, he's uh, been very serious about his political career and he does give some credit to our, our unit and our college. And so that's the type of um, student that we want to uh, demonstrate or, or, or represent our, our uh, department. And I say that he in, with some hesitation because he just got into office, so <laughs> I have to be careful when I say this is, this is the, the, the type of person. But he's, he's, he's been, he was a fine student in our college, none, definitely nonetheless. And we have uh, our manners chapter in Kentucky, which is uh, definitely a, a very strong component of our college. Uh, and, and I joke around, I always, I said it uh, to Nicole and uh, Kathy and Rama last night that we have officially become the most hated manners chapter in the country because Kentucky has uh, won national chapter of the year for four years in a row. Um, so this, but the students work very, very hard. They, uh, the work that they, put out on campus is head and shoulders above many of the large fraternities and sororities. Uh, they're serious about um, being of service to the Lexington community, not just UK. Uh, they also raise a lot of their money to support their own efforts. Um, so we're seeing some tremendous leadership skills developed in these students. And I've got a YouTube clip here that I wanted to share with you uh, with this young man, Marcus Tyler. Another one of our poster children. <laughs> and Marcus, when, when that was recorded, he was a freshman. And he is currently the national president, national student president for Manners. Uh, so as you can see, um, whoops. That's not a part of the presentation. Yeah. Man, I'm sorry, Manners um, it stands for Minorities in Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Related Sciences. Sorry about that. We have an agent at large program, and this is somewhat similar to the um, internship program. It gives those that are interested in a career in extension that may not be as familiar, um, sort of a, a, a trial run, if you will. So they can come in and see if extension is something that works for them and in turn we pretty much do the same but we have this has been has served us very well because uh, there have been times when we may not have had the funding for a full-time agent but putting someone in where there was a vacancy that individual could serve in, in, in that capacity and here we've got um, Thais Flores who's 
from Panama. Um, and she's actually working in a county where there is an, uh, a, a growing Hispanic population. And so it, it goes without question to say that she is making some very strong headway in that community and connecting with uh, that population where before it definitely was an underserved audience because the, the agents that were there did not have that experience and was not familiar with, that, with, with the culture, but she has taken it upon herself to really focus on that as far as her extension programming is, is concerned. So that agent at large program is uh, definitely uh, useful. So as you can see here, uh, it's a duration of 18 months, so they can apply for another position full time, and if the funding is available for the current position that they're in, they can apply for that one as well. And needless to say, if, if they're doing a good job, and many of them have, they would probably be head and shoulders above another candidate simply because they're in the community, folks know them, uh, they're familiar with uh, the needs of the needs and the issues there. So we're we're very proud of the agent large program that we have in place. Unique programming is another thing that's important. I just basically took a picture of a banner that was hanging on campus. And the reason why I did that was because, as you know, outside of the College of Agriculture, even at the land grant institution, you may have a lot of people that just don't quite understand what is it that we do, particularly with extension. And if they do, they have this notion that it is your very traditional programs. And in Louisville, we struggle with communicating that to the leaders there, the importance of extension. Our, our office is one of our larger offices. When I was in that office, there were 16 agents. It has drastically reduced since then. Um, but we always dealt with the issue of folks not really understanding us. And there were, I was a 4-H agent starting out there, and there were tons upon tons of youth programs. Every church had a after school program. Schools had after school programs. So getting your foot in the door, you really had to sort of collaborate and partner. And they were working on a, a project there, and this is a part of our SIFAR initiative that we had, Children, Youth, and Families at Risk. And we're working with homeless youth in Louisville. Well, when the university found out about this, they called us up and said, hey, tell us more about that. You know, Extension is doing this? This is, this is unique, isn't it? And I was like, well, yes and no. You know, we, we're always looking for things to serve the people. And so here we have it, and this banner is just outside of the president's office in, in, in our main building, and it's hanging there. So, so we'll take it. We'll take the free advertisement. Um, but it also lets folks know that we are stepping outside of your traditional programming and serving that population. The folks in Louisville are beginning to take more notice of what Extension is all about and, and what we're doing that's very innovative and new. So those things are, are, are critical when it comes to the leadership piece and that representation of the land grant system. And we also have to think about the, the, the important role that Extension plays in every community. We are fortunate to have a county office in every county throughout our state. So that, in many cases, is the first interface with UK. Um, and so it's an opportunity to recruit students. It's an opportunity for folks to learn more about the university. And so we are excited that now Louisville is beginning to see some different approaches to extension than what may be preconceived notions. So as I close here, I'm thinking I need to be wrapping up here. Uh, into the future, I, I mentioned the fact that it's important to see competitors as collaborators, if possible. Because some folks don't want to collaborate with us. I get that. Um, but I think it's important to know that if we're going to, to get the biggest bang for our buck, uh, that's key. And with that project that I talked about in Louisville, the working with homeless youth, we were contacted by YMCA. Because with CIFAR, you have to, it has to come out of the land grant institution. And so they contacted our county extension agents there who in turn followed up with us, and that's how we got this going. So we've got our SIFAR assistant housed at the YMCA, and an even better fit, we were fortunate to find someone that was able to work with this population because this, this is different. But he was a product of that environment. So how cool is that for him to be able to relate to those students that he's working with? And, um, but that partnership was, uh, is something that we could not have done by ourselves uh, as extension alone. So. Collaborating is, is, is an important part. Investing in all students and employees, I think we definitely know that that is something that's critical. Making sure that we're setting our objectives, achieving those, and then making sure that we're communicating our story. 
we don't brag on ourselves enough and we can't afford not to this day and time with the budget cuts and all the, the issues that are, that are surrounding that. And I tend to tell uh, our folks that you can be doing great work, but if you don't tell your story, it's, it's as if that work never happened. If no one knows about it, it's as if it never existed. So we've got to make sure that we're communicating what we're doing. Connecting the research to practice, the, the applied piece that I discussed, and I think uh, at this point we, we understand the, the return on investment when it comes to diversity and creating and utilizing our resources that are at our disposal, uh, whether it's the individuals that we're working with or as well as those collaborators that are outside of our organization. And so I think, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Abe Lincoln said it best about the overall mission of the land grant institution. And what it boils down to is making sure that whatever we're doing, whether it's students, clientele, our staff, our faculty, it has to be all about the people. And that's what's gonna keep us moving into the next century. So, thank you. <laughs>